Welcome to It's Dangerous to Build It Alone, take this. I hope everybody likes Zelda. Um, my name is Jeremy Rickard. I'm a co-chair of SIG Release in the Kubernetes project. I'm also a software engineer at Microsoft. Um, my team helps build and produce the open source software that's used inside of services like AKS, um, uh, Container Registry, stuff like that. Hi everyone, my name is Ashna and I'm a software engineer at Microsoft and a COPA maintainer. And today we're going to be talking about some best practices and tools to secure your supply chain. So why are we here and why is this important? So just in the past year, there's been a lot of reports of vulnerabilities being exploited. And it's important that we know what steps to take to mitigate this. So there's a pretty good chance that at least a majority of the people in this room are doing some type of vulnerability management. And while tools like Trivi can help make you aware of vulnerabilities, it's important that we actually understand and address them. So one thing you can try to do is you can try to go to GitHub and ask for dependency updates. And this is an example from the Kubernetes release repo asking to bump the Golang version because of a Trivi report. But Scanners don't have a way to do any real type of analysis, so you'll probably get a response like this saying that we can't do a dependency update just to satisfy a scanner. Another problem you can run into is you could be dependent on the upstream binaries when they're no longer available. So this example is from a older um, this example is from an older release. Our RPM for Kubernetes, which is no longer available for upgrade. So what do we do now to take the matters into our own hands? And is there any guidance that we can lean on to figure out the right thing to do? So today we're going to start by going over the secure supply chain consumption framework from the OpenSSF. And it just outlines a bunch of best practices around consuming and using open source software. So there's eight practices um, that it outlines, and we'll go over them and highlight some of the important ones and some of the tools you can use. And the first practice is ingest it. So this is just how are we going to consume the open source components. So this means using public package managers, using a open source um, binary repo manager solution, and also mirroring our OSS source code into an internal location. The next practice is scan it, which is pretty straightforward. It's using the open source scanning tools like Trivi to help make you aware of the vulnerabilities and CVEs. The next practice is inventory it, and we won't get into this too much today, but it's just a practice to have um, awareness of what you're using and a plan to respond. The fourth practice is update it. So after we scan, we want to have a way to address the vulnerabilities. And this could be manual or automated using tools like Dependabot or Copa that we'll talk about today. Next one, too. So once we have started to uh, ingest the, the open source components we're going to use, we started to scan and to update those. Uh, we also need to start auditing them so we can understand exactly where they're being used and feed that into our plan to respond to things. This could be um, you know, knowing what's being deployed. It could also be uh, actually auditing the components themselves to understand what the actual dependencies are, looking at the SBOM, uh, things like that. Next, uh, enforcing it. So once you have been able to audit things and understand things, you can start to enforce things. Uh, and this can be done at your cluster. It can be done in a number of different places. Uh, a solution in your cluster might be something like um, uh, Keyverno or Ratify or Open Policy Agent Gatekeeper, uh, making decisions based off of some of those um, uh, pieces of information that you've got for your software. And then next, we want to talk about actually rebuilding it. So we can do some things with patching. Copa is going to give us a good example of that. Uh, we can rely on upstream updates, but sometimes those aren't fast enough. And to really respond, we need to be able to rebuild from source ourselves. That allows us to fix things that are potentially not fixed upstream, um, but also to you know, bump dependencies where they may not actually be needed, but we want to have a, a more holistic approach to things. And then once we're able to do that rebuild from source, we can go that next step and be able to fix things before um, 
fixes come from upstream, perhaps we find a bug and we can fix it ourselves before it's even disclosed and then we can responsibly disclose it to the upstream project. So we talked about those eight practices at a high level. There were a lot of bullet points highlighted uh, on the right. You can get a lot more information at the, um, the OpenSSF uh, GitHub repo for this framework. We have a link at the end. But one thing to know for this is that there's a lot of individual pieces for that. And as you start to look at them, um, you may not need all of them. You may want to take them in waves. So they also provide a maturity model that shows you how to go from really, really basic to that more complex um, rebuild from source kind of model. Uh, we're gonna look at a few tools as we go through this. They're gonna have a, a large focus on CNCF projects. There are a ton of other things in the ecosystem, but we're really gonna focus on CNCF related things today. Okay, so now that we've gone through the model, let's get into the practices themselves. And we'll start with ingest it, which is consuming the upstream images. So when we have images in a registry like the Kubernetes registry or Docker Hub, we want to mirror them into our own registry to provide greater control. So this could be from a cloud provider like ACR or GCR, or you could use a tool like Harbor to host it um, in your own private network. Another tool that we want to highlight is Oros, and Oros is a CNCF sandbox project, and it provides a CLI and client libraries to distribute the artifacts across OCI compliant registries. So ORAS allows us to copy artifacts from one registry to another and also attach artifacts to images. So let's take a look at the ORAS tool. And normally when you're trying to get a image, you would do a Docker pull from the Docker registry and pull directly from the li Docker library. So we're pulling the Ubuntu 22.04 image here. But a better practice would be to copy it into your own registry, and we can use the ORAS copy command to do that. So we're copying it to the kubecon build it Azure container registry. And now we can pull directly from there and use it in a Docker file if we need to. All right, so we have started to uh, ingest that container, that Ubuntu container. Um, let's talk about things we can do to help audit and understand what is in that container. Um, we're gonna start to talk about adding additional context to that image, and we're gonna look at ORAS again in a way to help us um, take some artifacts that we're gonna generate from that image and attach them so that they're discoverable and usable in policy enforcement later on. So we've got another quick demo here. Uh, we are going to first generate an S-bomb for this container. These could exist upstream and uh, you should consume those, but if you, if you don't get those, uh, one thing you can do is use a tool like SIFT to be able to generate uh, an S-bomb for that. There's a bunch of other tools that'll do this as well, but we just chose SIFT for this example. So SIFT is running against that container image and it's gonna analyze the layers uh, to understand what packages have been installed. Um, and we'll let that run for just a second. And once it's done, we will end up with, in, th in this case, an SPDX JSON file, so specific type of SBOM. Um, we can examine it and see some of the packages that exist inside the container. See a whole bunch of them because it's an Ubuntu-based image. Um, now that we've generated that, we actually want to attach it. So ORAS has an attach command, uh, different than that copy command. And what it allows you to do is use um, something called the referrers API to store that as an artifact in the registry and then associate it with a target artifact. So we'll take a look at the manifest for it really quick. So we're gonna discover first and we can see this kind of hierarchical relationship. And um, we'll look, look at another one in a second that has the, the full manifest so you can see what that kind of looks like. But now we've got the SBOM attached and uh, you could use the ORS tool to, uh, to pull that as well. Okay, so now we are going to fast forward a little bit. Um, is this the right one? This is the right one. Okay, we're gonna fast forward, let's say six months. We have that Ubuntu image in our registry and there's a vulnerability in it. We're gonna import a new version or perhaps upgrade to something else, but we actually wanna say that this thing shouldn't be used anymore. So we're gonna use uh, OCI artifacts again for this and in essence create an empty artifact that just has annotations. We can't go add annotations directly to the image itself because it would result in a brand new image. You, know, you get a different hash 
or different digests for that thing. Um, but this allows you to add new OCR artifacts to your registry and associate them so that you can discover them in, in the same process as that SBOM. And then you can use that inside of something like Keyverno or, or, or OPA to say, if this artifact has an attachment with an end of life date, we should reject it from the cluster. So the, let's pause for one sec. This is an example of what that manifest looks like. Uh, right here, you can see the end of life date. Um, and then above it, there is a section called subject. And that's where it's going to refer to what you've attached it to. So you live a separate artifacts in the registry, just like the SBOM does. But it has that kind of uh, parent-child relationship between them. All right. OK, and then. You've got all of these things. So let's resume here. Um, and remember now we've got two different artifacts, right? We've got our end of life annotations and we also have our SBOM. We really want to make sure that those things aren't tamperable with and we want to make sure that we understand who pushed them and they're not really reputable. So one thing you can do for that is to sign them. Um, you can sign the container image. That's another really good practice. Signing these artifacts themselves along with that is an even better practice. Here we're gonna use a tool called Notation. Um, there's, again, multiple things in the space that will support this, but uh, we're using Notation for this. And Notation allows you to sign any OCI artifact in a registry, so a container image or the SBOM or the end of life annotation. So we're gonna sign all of those things. And then, again, with policy enforcement later on, we could validate and ensure that the things we're pulling into the container or into the cluster are signed. And then we're making policy decisions based off of those things, we can ensure that those are also signed and, and verifiable. You can see the same kind of hierarchy there. All right. Okay, so once we have our images imported and ingested and we have policies in force, we actually want to be able to scan and update the images. So let's discuss ways we can go about updating images. So the first option is to wait for base image updates. So we have our Ubuntu image and our own registry, but waiting for a base image update could take a long time, sometimes months, and that takes away control from you as a developer or a user of the image. Another option is to rely on the package managers to do the updates, but this requires you to have a good understanding of the package managers and also the base image, which won't always be the case. And this also won't work for distroless images, so if the package manager isn't in the image itself, you won't be able to do this. So a solution to these update problems is COPA, and COPA is a CNCF sandbox project that patches container images. It's based on BuildKit, which is Docker's default builder, and it allows you to update vulnerable or outdated packages in your image. So you could do a targeted patching by default using a Trivi report, and it'll scan that report and look for vulnerable OS vulnerabilities to update. And that's also pluggable with different scanners. Or you can decide to update all of the outdated packages to the most recent version. So this is a diagram explaining how COPA works. The bottom left is your image, and it's made up of the different layers, like the OS, language, framework, and application layers. But COPA focuses on those OS vulnerabilities. And using a external tool like Trivi, you'd create your vulnerability report. And then you could pass that into COPA to parse. So COPA will parse that report for the required updates and then download them. And it creates a diff with the file system to figure out which um, updates were downloaded. And then using BuildKit's diff and merge operation, it creates that resulting patch layer. So let's take a look at the COPA tool. And for the demo, we'll try to patch a Nginx image with known vulnerabilities. So we'll first scan it with Trivi um, to see how many vulnerabilities are present. And we'll specify that we want OS vulnerabilities and we'll ignore any unfixable ones. So there's 231 vulnerabilities right now in this image. And let's run Trivi again, but save the output to a JSON file this time. So once that's generated, we can pass that into COPA to patch. So we're specifying the image and the report that we just generated. 
And by default, Copa will create a new image with the dash patch tag appended to it. And as Copa is running, it's installing those specific vulnerable packages using apt, since apt is the default package manager in the Nginx image. And once it's exported, we can check for that image locally using Docker images. And now we know that's there. And then we can run Trivi with the same parameters that we were checking for before to see if the vulnerabilities were patched. So now there's zero vulnerabilities. And we can also run this um, image as a container to make sure that it still works as we expected it to. And it looks like that works. So this is an example of what the resulting image layers would look like. So the most recent layer um, that we see is that patch layer that we saw in the diagram before. And it's created using the build kit exporter. And something that we optimized recently is that there's only one patched layer created. So you don't have to worry about the layers um, creating a very large image if you patch with Copa multiple times. So some benefits of using something like Copa to update your images is it's giving control to who's patching the container images. So like we were saying before, you don't have to wait for the base image updates. It's also a custom patching solution, so you can target different vulnerabilities from different scan reports or target all the outdated packages. Um, it also reduces the time, cost, and complexity for patching. And since it's a single CLI tool, it's easy to integrate into your pipelines. So you could do a build time patch where you patch images before you publish them, or you could do a recurring patch to scan and patch your images weekly. Copa can also integrate with Dependabot, and Dependabot's a tool that scans your repositories and updates outdated dependencies through a PR. So you could use that with Copa to update tags to the Copa patched version. And finally, Copa can patch distroless images as well. So even if the package manager isn't in the image itself, Copa can download the updates using an external tooling image. Some limitations of Copa are that it can't patch app-specific vulnerabilities, and that's because we can't go into the source code and rebuild our applications. We also can't patch Windows images, and we're dependent on the package managers themselves. So while Copa can help us address a lot of issues and vulnerabilities, like we were saying before, we can't update um, app-level vulnerabilities. And if you look back at the maturity model, that's something that we want to be able to do and rebuild from source. So let's get into the rebuild it practice and see ways we can rebuild our open source dependencies. So the first thing we would do is going back to our ingested practice, which was um, mirroring our project to a source control that we use. And using GitHub, this is pretty easy since we can just fork the repo. Um, but we can run into a problem with this, which is keeping our repos in sync. So if we look here, we didn't keep this repo in sync, and it's almost 6,000 commits behind master. And even if we do figure out a way to keep it in sync using either manually or using the GitHub CLI, we actually have to get into building from the source. And there's a lot of issues that come up when we try to do this and a lot of questions that we have to answer. So how do we know what tools and commands to use? How do we know exactly what to build? How does this change between versions? And how do we go about testing? So if we take a look at some of the pipelines that are handling the building, we can see how this varies. So this is the Cilium pipeline. And in this case, it's pretty simple. We ran a make target, and we just specified the image and the architecture. And it was pretty simple. Um, with the test and publish stages and running the E2E tests from upstream. But if we take a look at something like Envoy, it could get a lot more complicated. Um, and that's because the build changed between versions. So in the 1.25 build, 
versus the 1.26 build, we had different requirements. Um, and while it may seem like a simple change in the scripts, the complexity can increase as we have to handle different conditional logic. All right, so now we kind of understand how to build things. We know there's some complexity there, uh, but we're able to do it, right? We can build pipelines in GitHub Actions, or we could use Azure DevOps, something like that. Uh, what benefit does that give us? Well, it lets us fix things. So let's take a look at another example. So we've got um, CSI Secret Store Driver. This is a, a project that uh, you've probably used or maybe, maybe you've heard of. Uh, we build it uh, along with a bunch of other things. In this case, uh, the upstream project is using an older version of Go. So it's using Go 121, which is end of life at this point. Um, there are some CVEs in that version of Go, also some dependencies, and Trivi is gonna report that for us. So this is a really good example of how we could start to fix these things when we're rebuilding from source. So how does this one get built? Uh, well, it's pretty simple again. Um, you can just run docker build and use the docker file. That's what the upstream project does. So that docker file under slash docker is where we probably can find what we need to fix. And indeed, if we look at this, um, this docker file, we see exactly uh, where the, the go um, image is used. And it's specifically pinned to a go 121 uh, revision. So let's fix it. We can do that by generating a patch file. So in this case, all we're doing is modifying the, um, the Docker file to swap to use uh, a newer version of Go with no, dependent, with no vulnerabilities. Once we rebuild using that, the exact same build process will work, but we, we're gonna end up with something that resolves those dependencies. But doing this for a lot of projects gets complicated pretty quickly because you've got to understand the different base images that are in use. You've got to understand the, the tooling that's in use. You've got to understand all of these things. And really, as you start to build these patches out, testing becomes even more important. And the more variables that we've got in play tends to complicate things and make it harder to sustain that over a long term. So what's a better approach? A better approach might be to take a more focused, more systematic approach where we maybe focus on a reduced set of base images. And that's probably gonna require us to make changes to those projects. Um, maybe leveraging packages where they weren't being leveraged before, minimizing dependencies, so maybe analyzing the projects to figure out if there are unneeded things in that base image that we can get rid of, and then standardizing the container build so we have basically one workflow for that. A really good example of this in the ecosystem is what ChainGuard has been doing with ChainGuard images. If you go to their repos, if you look at the, the images, they've got a really standardized process built around a Linux distribution they've created, or undistribution they've created called Wolfie, where they build packages for the open source projects that they're gonna produce images for, and then they build really small distributed containers with just those things and the needed dependencies. And they can rebuild those things really quickly because it's a single workflow. So we, look, we took a look at that, but we've got some other constraints that didn't really fit into that. One, we can't use that kind of base image. We, um, we need to build an Azure Linux as our requirement, but we also need to build Debian and Windows things, which doesn't fit into that. Um, we have a requirement to use trusted package managers inside. We have a requirement to use mirrored sources. We also have a requirement to use Microsoft tooling, like the Microsoft fork of Go. So to handle that, we started building a tool, again, based on BuildKit, uh, I think BuildKit's pretty great, called Dalek. And what Dalek allows us to do is take an approach that's very similar to what ChainGuard is doing by building system packages for those open source applications and then building distroless containers from those things. Uh, we can do that for Azure Linux, we can do it for Debian. Uh, we can also build Windows containers out of this as well. Those are a little different, but they, they kind of work. Um, this is really cool because it allows us to leverage those uh, Azure Linux packages that are internal and built and maintained by other teams. So for us, it's really beneficial because we can leverage the expertise they already are, are doing. Because it's BuildKit based, we don't need any extra tooling. Dalek is really just a front end for BuildKit. It's a container. Um, you, you can basically run Docker build, and we'll see that in a second, and produce containers or RPMs or DEBs or zip files of Windows binaries. And because it's using um, BuildKit directly, we can get out of the box SBOM and Providence generation because that's a, a feature that just happens to exist in BuildKit now, so it's pretty cool. And we use a single kind of spec file for this that's not a Docker file, so we'll take a look at that now. So we start off with a declaration at the beginning of the file. Um, this is the syntax you use for specifying uh, which BuildKit front end you wanna use. If you're building with Docker normally and you're using a Docker file, this is implicit, and BuildKit behind the scenes knows what to do. 
But what this does is instruct BuildKit to use that container image to parse this file and turn it into all of the under the, the low-level um, build statements that BuildKit needs to actually produce the artifacts. We have some metadata in here, like what's going to be in the package, but specifically at the top, we have some arguments defined that we're going to reference, uh, like the commit and the arguments. We make one spec file for each version that we're going to build, and that allows us to patch things and produce new revisions of the RPMs over time um, and have that difference of build steps from, from version to version. So again, uh, specifying the revision and the version for the package. Then we move into our sources. Uh, we can have Git sources, HTTP sources, and local. In this case, you can see we have a, a, a Git source for the Core DNS repo. And we also have a directory of patch files that we're going to apply. Then we list the build time and runtime dependencies. We build a, uh, a build container for this with only the dependencies we need. Um, and we also build, a, at the runtime, just the runtime dependencies. Because we're using Microsoft Go in a a FIPS kind of way, we need OpenSSL at, run, at, at the runtime. That's the only dependency that Core DNS needs. And then also the patches were referenced there. Um, and then inside of here, we've got the build steps. Uh, you're still going to have to understand that. And no matter what solution you use, you have to understand how to build the actual project. That could be running a make file. It could be calling Go directly like this. Um, we define some artifacts uh, to, to specify what's going to be in the RPM. Because you, you know, have mul multiple things from what's cloned, but you only want the binary in this case. And that's what's going to get installed into the container. And we can do things like configure the entry point or, or any other thing you might see in a Docker file, like environment variables, things like that. And the way this works, uh, again, is by using the Docker tooling. So we take that spec and we pass it into Docker th through a Docker build. We specify what file we're using, just like uh, dash f docker file dot whatever. And then that gets passed to the build kit front end because of that first directive in the spec. BuildKit then goes and fetches the sources, does the building, produces the artifacts, and then you're done. So we, we get the artifacts back, and then it's either uh, a container uh, or a pa system package or Windows binaries. Could also be an RPM spec or um, a Debian config file. Okay, so here's a demo of building with Dalek. So we're going to look at Core DNS again, um, and again, we're going to default back to Trivi to kind of kick things off. Okay, so... We are going to skip this. So we're running Trivi, and we can see here, uh, this image has a lot of vulnerabilities in it. It's pretty old, though. This is 194. It's a pretty old version of Trivi, or, or sorry, of Core DNS. So let's build it with Dalek. And we had that patch directory, and we're going to see here, that we're going to apply two patches, actually. So let's look at the, the contents of that directory. Um, there are the patch files. It's going to bump the version of Go and also a, a number of Go um, dependencies in the Go mod file. Now we will run Docker build, and we're going to request a Mariner 2 container. Mariner 2 is the code word for Azure Linux 2. And as that runs, we're also going to ask it for the provenance um, and the SBOM. Then we're going to tag it, and we're going to push it to a registry because it's just Docker behind the scenes. So this will run, and it's going to first build the RPM. And then it's going to build the container itself. So we can see it's pushing that now. There was a lot of cache there, so it went pretty quickly. But really, we were just running Docker, right? So that experience is pretty simple. Because of uh, how we built this, asking for the SBOM and the provenance information, those are actually, in this case, embedded into the manifest themselves. That's how Docker, or how BuildKit does that. Instead of having them attached, like we saw with Oris, you could take them out and then attach them if that's how your workflow is kind of operating now. Uh, but this will show us what that looks like. So we see, hey, we've got our container image here, just one architecture. And then here is uh, the annotations manifest that will have the SBOM and the provenance information. We can then use Docker's um, build, to, uh, the buildx image tools command to be able to actually examine those things and see what's inside of them. So here we're gonna look at the provenance information and see what materials were used to build this. So this is a salsa provenance file, and it's gonna list out all of the things that were used to deploy this. Run right there. So we see, uh, hey, there's a digest for the Dalek front end that was used. Here is the base image that was used, um, another piece of the container image, and then uh, the repo along with the commit that was used. So we could extract that and attach it like we did with ORAS. Um, we could leave it like this. It really depends on how we want to consume those things in, in that workflow. Okay. So what did we learn or what did we go over today? I think we kind of had a whirlwind tour of many tools. Um, but some important things to take away from this. Uh, you should mirror your OSS dependencies. It, if it's as simple as copying the container images into a registry that you control, that will save you trouble, whether it's 
avoiding Docker Hub rate limitations, or whether it's uh, the Kubernetes project migrating from kates.gcr.io to registry.kates.io. Do the same thing for binaries and packages. It will help you out a lot. You want to start scanning and signing those things after you're ingesting them because it's going to give you a lot more assurances about what you're using and, and a better feeling, uh, more protection about uh, you know, those things being injected or intercepted or modified. Copa will help you with patching, but it's only going to really help you with patching open source dependencies. Building from source is a, a much better idea, but it's also not free. There's a lot of complexity and a lot of steps that come into that. So make sure if you're going to go that route, that you allocate resources. If you want the similar kind of thing and you want to pay for it, ChainGuard is a great place to go for that. Some links, uh, if you want to take a look at any of the projects we talked about today, you can find them here. Um, they're also on the slides that are uploaded to the session. And the last slide has a survey. So if you want to give us feedback on the session, we'd love to hear it. You can use this QR code to access the the survey feedback. Um, and with that, we've got like four minutes left. If anybody has questions, we'd love to, to answer them. Uh, if not, you can step down the side at the end. So there's a microphone. If you could go to the mics, I think that would be best. It'll show up on the recording. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for presentation. Uh, so uh, do you have a registry or uh, images uh, built with uh, Azure's uh, Direct? Yeah, we are starting to produce those, and they are in um, the Microsoft Artifact Registry, or, M or it's still called mcr.microsoft.com. Um, these are the things that are going to be used inside of AKS or other Azure services. Um, they're available at, I think, slash OSS slash V2 in the name of the project, name of the image. Um, so they're already being published to, to MAR today. Uh, so uh, what kind of images uh, do you have? Um, so, so far, we've got Kubernetes images, uh, Core DNS as an example, Eraser. There's a copacetic image. Um, basically, our team is responsible for building and publishing uh, anything in the CNCF ecosystem that's going to get consumed with inside of Azure, and they're all going to go through this workflow. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I was wondering uh, uh, if uh, you were interested in uh, distributing uh, compiler images, uh, such as uh, Golang slash Go or uh, C compilers or uh, JDK. We, we don't handle those. So those aren't in the CNCF ecosystem, really. Yeah. Um, we are building Go packages, though. Yeah. So we are building Microsoft Go uh, for yeah. Debian and Ubuntu um, with, with Dalek uh, for use inside of Azure. Oh, thanks. Yeah, if, uh, if somebody was just wanting to get started, you know, like you have, uh, you have Docker files in a repo and, you know, you know how to go and manually change the base image update, do you, but you want to do the next thing. Um, you know, you gave a lot of great options here. What would you say to do first? I think uh, having the ability to, to mirror the source and build from that and publish for your own consumption, even if it's just using the upstream builds, is a super good step. Um, the complexity with like switching the base images is going to come down to how do I keep that in sync with the upstream fork, right? Um, it's, it's easy to sync a repo when there are no divergences in the branch, but once you start actually making changes to that fork, that just builds, builds more, um, more work in for you. So starting with being able to build from that upstream project and understanding how to do that is, is a really, really great first step. Um, going to that next level, uh, figuring out a strategy to how to handle when you're deviating from, from upstream is going to be your, your best next step. Thank you. All right. Well, if anybody has any questions after this, we will hang out to the side. You can come over and ask us, and we'd be happy to chat more. Thanks. Thank you.